Mr. Van der Heide, during World War II, you were an Unterscharfuhrer with the 10th Panzer SS Division on the Eastern Front in 1944. Is that correct? Uh, it's not quite correct. I was not in the Waffenhaus on the Eastern Front, but I ended up as such in the Western Front. On the Western Front. What was your most memorable experience while you were serving with the Waffen SS on the Western Front? Is there anything that particularly stands out? In, in your combat well, it experience? Was, of course, uh, the Allied landing in Arnhem and the House to house combat in Arnhem. In Arnhem, yeah. And was that a surprise attack on the Allies? Was that a, a defensive uh, holding action on your part, or was that offensive, or what? Arnhem, because they, were, they didn't think that there would be any German troops left in the area. And uh, we were. Just a remnant. We wanted the foot. The complete unit was no longer there. But uh, the rear party of the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Division were still in Arnhem. So uh, that uh, we had we had the occasion to give them a hot a hot reception when they landed in Arnhem. This was a surprise then. They had no idea that they, they had no idea at all that the thing like that would happen right there and then. No. When you say the remnant of the uh, of the 10th Panzer Division, this happened. What was the size of this remnant in troop strength? Oh, I couldn't couldn't say offhand how they were. Home. Battalion, but, battalion yeah, strength. Yeah, about uh, two battalion size. But I'm not sure. I couldn't to be too sure about it. I don't uh, uh, fix me up on that. I couldn't tell you. Too. Maybe maybe two battalions. I remember very clearly that they were very, very scared because they probably thought that the end of their days had come. And now they found themselves in the captivity of the, of the weapon SS. And they felt that as a result of being uh, POWs captured by the Waffen SS that they were going to be mistreated or killed. Is that correct? It was quite awfully obvious from their attitude. And what actually happened to those uh, POWs that you had in your uh, care? Well, uh, in, uh, in spite of all the confusion that, uh, of course, uh, will occur in such a situation, they were uh, wounded on both sides. We had our wounded fellows, and they were treated exactly the same as our wounded. They, our medical orderlies would take care of them, and uh, some of them were under shock, uh, apparently under shock effect, they were given treatment for that, and they were given, and we even shared our last cigarettes with them, and uh, chocolate and whatever we, got, we had available. And this was a surprise to the, to the Americans again. So okay. these POWs were Americans, and what other allied uh, nationalities Poles did you have? Poles and Brits. And they were shocked to be receiving medical care from the SS medics, the same as the SS would give to a German soldier? Yeah, they obviously had not expected a thing like that. Uh, why had they had this expectation about the SS that was so negative? I can only put it down to a lot of uh, vicious propaganda, which was being meted out at, uh, at a time, so that uh, the individual soldier may have been under the impression that he didn't have uh, uh, no dealings with human beings, but with, uh, with, with straight criminals. That's all, that's all I can say. Because in this attitude, to me, uh, to my mind, was absolutely incomprehensible. And uh, nowadays, in 1985, when uh, the SS is regarded to be a heinous organization which committed all kinds of atrocities, uh, why don't the people, uh, the, uh, the uh, survivors, the Allied survivors, the Americans, the British, and the Poles, who receive this beneficial treatment from the SS, uh, why don't they come forward in 1985 to refute some of the charges which have been laid against the SS? That is a very good question, which I can't answer. All I can say that uh, whenever I meet or I have met after the war, an American or British soldier who had really been in the war, same as I, on the other side, I never had any compunction about mentioning to him when he asked me what outfit I was in, that I was in the Waffen SS, and I was always received with enthusiasm. They were honored even to speak to me. And they, they, uh, because they had known us on the other side, and they know these people that 
have actually been involved in the frontline survey. People had experience. And the, the uh, bad reputation of the Waffen SS could also stem from the fact that we, of course, elite uh, crack troops, so to speak. I would say so, yes. Uh, we, are, we were naturally, uh, from the beginning, uh, all volunteers. And I must say, although I was not in the Waffen SS right from the start, I had volunteered myself in, uh, at the age of 17 in 1941. But I wasn't accepted for, uh, for medical reasons. And so I, uh, I was uh, drafted. Was part of what I went to an anti aircraft outfit and spent a few weeks well, a couple, next, next few months in, in France, in northern France, uh, where we, uh, we had these uh, 88 millimeter guns. And as you know, at the time, uh, this area of northern France was flown over every day by hundreds. He yeah, distributed them so that. Uh, the uh, fighter bo fighters would have an easier task. Well, and from there, we were suddenly, very suddenly, in other major cities in the Ukraine. In the USSR? In the USSR, in the Ukraine. So you were fighting in the Soviet Union in 1943? That's right. And uh, from then on, uh, this was when I arrived in Chaco, it was, it was the last time that city had was reoccupied by the Germans. It had. Uh, uh, changed the occupants three or four times before. And from then on, the, the, uh, we were more or less on the retreat to the area of Shitomir, which is the capital of the Ukraine, and further west, places like Shitomir and Berdichev. And uh, towards Christmas in that same year, it was on Christmas Eve exactly, we were overrun by two divisions uh, of Russian infantry and uh, artillery and things like that and thousands of, of tanks. So we lost all our guns within half an hour. We were all destroyed. How were they destroyed? By the tanks? By, by, by the, the tanks, yeah. By the tanks. What was your, did you have any relationship with the local people in the Ukraine when you were serving in that area? Oh, certainly. We used to uh, uh, we used to be quartered in their in their in their huts, so what they did, which were normally uh, thatched roofs, you know, these small farmhouses they had, and and they were very kindly to us, and we were kind to them. We had no reason whatsoever to be any, any for any animosity against the, the Russian people, not at all. In fact, when they had a, a celebration, for instance, I remember on occasion a, a, a boy of 21 and his his sister, they were twins. Where they had a 21 uh, birthday celebration, so we were all very happy, and, and they were playing the balalaika, and we were dancing, and all that sort of thing. It was not a, not at all any uh, any animosity with the Russian people. I can say that. And then, so you were driven back in this counterattack by the Soviet forces, which were these T-34 tanks that were amassed. Yes, yeah. When uh, at the beginning of the Russian campaign, we had uh, the normal. The German army had the normal anti-tank guns, and they had uh, very quickly proved uh, rather inefficient against, especially this tank uh, with the number T-34, because it was uh, it was covered with a thick layer of reinforced concrete. So whenever it was hit by a shell, it didn't do any harm to the tank. It was just a a hole the size of a fist in the surface of the concrete, and the tank moved on. So uh, this is a reason why they, uh, the uh, high command decided to use these anti-aircraft 88 millimeters against these tanks. Wasn't that uh, Rommel's idea that he had it used was, that in Africa? I understand. It, it was, uh, Rommel had had some experience with these uh, tanks, uh, with these um, uh, anti-aircraft uh, guns, uh, 88 millimeters, in, uh, in the African campaign. So naturally, it was repeated in, uh, in Russia also. Now, um, you asked me about the experiences which have been re uh, remained vivid in my memory, and that was shortly after that, in the early, early January 1944, when we were waiting to be refurnished from the, with everybody that was not exactly involved with the guns themselves, if, uh, the, uh, 
the gunners, you know. From uh, myself at the time, I was serving as, uh, as a telephone operator, and others were uh, medical orderlies, and others were uh, maybe uh, uh, typists and, and things like that. All these uh, people from the whole battalion were, around, were called together, and we were ordered to move about 15, 50 kilometers away from there, right in the middle of the forest, where they said was the headquarters of the partisans. And uh, we were about 120 men, 20 of us, uh, and uh, so we moved towards this village. And uh, this little combat unit, as you may call it, was, uh, was led by, uh, by the medical officer, strangely enough, the medical officer. So when we Why was a medical officer leading the unit? Well, he was uh, also one of those officers, that were also his personnel, was, we were not directly involved with the guns. Because they had to, 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 to stay around, because the guns could arrive any day, any hour now, see, that's the reason. Uh, so, uh, when we closely before coming to that village, the, the uh, doctor, he, uh, he had to figure out a plan. He said, what I'm doing now, we stop there, and that I'm going in the village right now with 20 of you, and the rest of us, you will be distributed in three circles around this village, and we'll... Uh, Inve we have, uh, investigate what's going on there, if it is really a headquarters of the partisans and whatever. The headquarters of what? Of the partisans of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Russian guerrillas. Guerrilla oh, forces. the partisans. The partisans, see? Eh? The uh, Russian guerrilla forces. Okay, and, and then well, I thought, well, then the, our order was to uh, remain there until further order. So we waited there for uh, one hour, half an hour, uh, half an hour, one hour, maybe one and a half hour, and then very shortly, but very clearly, there was heavy machine, the noise of heavy machine gun fire from the direction of the outside village, and then a dead silence again. So uh, we had ordered to wait, and as good soldiers we did so, we were waiting for another while, and then a messenger came, uh, came around and had uh, ordered us and gave us messages to go to the village to, uh, to gather there, and there was some uh, a collection in the village. So we went to the village, and there I saw these uh, medical officers and 19 of my cameras, one of them had got away. They were hung up on a tree like pig, their feet up to upside down, and uh, they were cut from uh, all the way through like, like a butcher would would exhibit his uh, pig in, in his window, in his shop window. And uh, some, of, some of them, they had uh, they cut their, their, their uh, tes testicles off when they were stuck in, in their mouths and all that. It was a, such a dreadful sight that I was sick for, for weeks after that. It would never, never really, really get, uh, go away from my memory. And uh, it is, of course, uh, uh, it's nothing, it was nothing surprising. It, it, I'm not uh, relating an, uh, uh, just one single incident. Things like that were happen, uh, happen, uh, happening in Russia, in that part of the world, practically every day. These were the irregular forces, the so-called Soviet partisans, who were committing these actions. Is that correct? I thought so, too. But uh, when we finally, when we rounded up these villages and cleared out the houses, there was not one single religious crime was committed exclusively by their women, by women. By the Soviet women? By the Soviet women, yeah. So, uh, why did they have this intense hatred? Why, why would, what would motivate them to perform such an atrocity? Well, I don't know. You say, again, uh, there must be, uh, uh, must have been uh, quite a bit of propaganda on the, on the, on the Russian side against the Germans. But uh, I would say that the, that the whole enterprise was a mistake. It was a bit, a bit careless of, the, of these uh, medical officers to, to go right in that village, in, the, in this area, in the middle of a forest, you know. And, and that is, uh, and the women just took advantage of the situation. There were only 20 of them, so uh, before they even had a chance to leave the trucks, uh, to leave that lorry, they are already fired at them, shot at them with their machine guns. And that's what we heard. That was the machine gun we had heard from the wooden. So if one, if one or two of my, my cameras were killed right in that, in, in that truck, they were lucky in a way, you know, and I, I may say so. 
while the others were badly wounded and then uh, quickly overcome, and uh, they they cut their throats with open jam cans, with open food cans. They ripped their they cut their throats and all that. And uh, these all these bodies naturally, of course, were medically examined, and uh, it was uh, established that uh, there were. More they were still alive when they, when this had happened, and it was not just a show to do with dead bodies. Some of them were alive when they were having their Some throats. Some of them were alive when they had their coats cut, uh, cut uh, the throats cut with cans, with open, ripped open tin cans. And where did this take place? And that was in the area of Proskurov in the Ukraine, Proskurov, Chitomir, Berdichev, around that area, close to the uh, to what, what was. Uh, what was at that time the Polish border, which is no longer the Polish border, it's, you know, it's, it's now uh, all Russian territory. Why did some of the Ukrainians uh, in the other village give you such a warm reception, and yet were these women Ukrainian or were these Russian who attacked the, uh, uh, your comrades? Well, I, I don't really know whether they we There was, um, if I remember, there were two different kinds of uh, guerrillas in what they had to, to fight for their country, but they were certainly not communist. Right? They, they weren't were, fighting for Stalin, they, they, they were, were fighting, fighting, fighting for their country. For nationalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, partisans, it was they that did these ugly deeds. So you would describe these women even as partisans? Sure, sure they were partisans. And, and uh, it is uh, got a hold, got a hold of a, of, a, of the Germans, and they would never take a prisoner. They would kill him right away. They were far more brutal than the men. These women, these women battalions. So when you went into the town and discovered what these women had done, uh, was there some action then taken against the women? Oh yeah, the uh, the place uh, the place was set on fire. Uh, the one of these uh, two uh, 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 was uh, burning, and there was a strong wind blowing, and as I said, the houses were thatched, uh, you know, they were covered, covered with roofs, so in no time the, the whole the village was, was burning. And then these women came out. Can you, you know, translate what they were saying? Huh? What were they saying? Pan, pan. Pan, pan, that, that is uh, the uh, equivalent for, uh, that means uh, sir, 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 you know, it's equivalent to the English sir. And then uh, they were, in other words, are pleading for mercy. And uh, who set the houses on fire? The SS? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, oh no, it was uh, sure. I think that because uh, it was, it was, uh, because these these people were hiding, and uh, I, I must say that my commanding officer must uh, must uh, add that in, at this point. He was a uh, was a lef lieutenant, uh, um, oberleutnant from from the Munster. And that is quite obvious. Any other unit, and any other army in the whole world would have done the same thing under the same circumstances. Well, what no. specifically, what action was taken besides burning the village? When the women came out on their knees, then what happened to them? I don't know what happened to them. I think they were taken away, but whatever happened to them... At any time during the uh, privations that you experienced and the suffering, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Did you ever question why you had been sent hundreds or thousands of miles from your homeland to engage in this combat? Oh yes, of course. I was firmly convinced that uh, we were not only fighting for Germany, but for the rest of Europe. And uh, it was unbelievable to us uh, that the uh, Allied wouldn't accept it. And, and uh, of, of course it was also very demoralizing uh, when my comrades and friends received letters from home with the information that their houses had been bombed at home and that places like Dortmund, uh, Hamburg and Dresden were burning and all these things, you know, that was very demoralizing. This is uh, civilian sections of large German cities that were uh, bombed and set afire by Allied Air Force planes? Oh, yes, of course. And, and not only that, you know, they, not only that they bombed the, the civilian that the uh, civilian quarters, you know, they, they really singled them out in the big cities. You know, they, one quarter after the other, one section after the other, they came back and uh, wiped it wiped out. And when these poor people uh, managed to get out of, uh, of that in inferno to save their lives, then they would come down with their low diving, flying uh, 
bombers and, and shoot at every living creature there. Strafe them with machine gun strafe fire. Strafe from them, the strafe them with machine guns. These yeah. are British and American. Uh, this was American to light. There was no difference at all. So this was a motivating factor that steeled you in your determination to push on in the Eastern Front, or yes, because did it demoralize you? Uh, because we were, we were, we felt that the destiny of the whole of Europe was at stake. Not only our own country, the, the destiny of the whole of Europe. And uh, with the experience we had every day, similar to what I just described now, we yeah, I, I believe you're referring to the Soviet Union, yeah. was victorious. Do you feel that it has been the end of the Western world? Well, that's a good question. I, I believe that if, thing, if things had uh, turned out differently, if the Allies would have agreed in 1945 on what to do with Germany, instead of uh, coming to a clash between East and West, things would, uh, would have been much, uh, perhaps far worse for Germany. You know? Now, uh, as, everybody, as you know, the things moved uh, in a quite a different way. The Allies, uh, the, the, the uh, negotiations in Yalta and elsewhere came to a deadlock. And uh, yet, in my, in my opinion, the existence of the atomic bomb. If it hadn't have, been for that, I think uh, the, things, uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole event of that would have been quite different. I'd like to get back to that, or bring that up later on. But I wanted to ask you, once uh, after this incident with the village occurred, where the men were butchered, uh, and uh, you were then pushed back and uh, transferred to the Western Front at this time, or did you still see more action on the yeah, Eastern Front? Yeah, I saw some more action, and uh, in uh, in Eastern Eastern Poland. And uh, in fact, I was stationed for one while, only uh, only about or oh, it's less than ten kilometers away from from the place where, uh, as we all know today, uh, uh, this uh, concentration camp of Majdanek was. Which was a German concentration camp. Yeah, in Lublin. And I only, all I remember is that uh, I never heard anything. But I knew there was uh, was a camp in the area, but uh, there were hundreds of, of uh, poles uh, running around, uh, civilians. You know, there were some uh, on the day uh, during the day they were working for for the German army. They had different kinds of jobs and way, uh, working for them. About, uh, do you mean to imply that these were civilians who had free access to go into the camps and also leave the camps? I don't know that. I was not, I never got ready so that close to the camp that I, that I was able to work. I, I couldn't tell you. But what I mean that in, in those areas, they, 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 are, um, they were free to move. And uh, they certainly had communication somehow with one another. So, uh, and if anything of the sort had been known, there would uh, there certainly uh, I would we would have heard of it. And, sure. and you feel then that, in other words, there was some kind of communication between poles in the camp and the concentration camp and poles outside of it. Yeah. And as a result of you being stationed nearby, had there been some kind of genocide occurring within it, yeah. that that sort of activity would not have been easily disguised and you would have heard about it conjecturally. Sure, because uh, the, I also spoke to some poles who were actually working in the camp. Um, but who were allowed to go somehow to go home again? So, so uh, they were in the camp. They were working there, doing some also. And I'm quite sure that some of them they were they had their uh, they had confidence in us. You know, they wouldn't be afraid or something. You know, we were only very small soldiers. You know, and if anything, I'm quite sure they would have mentioned any, uh, 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 anything like this to us. There was just, when you say small soldiers, there was just a, a tiny detachment of Yeah, no, we were just ordinary soldiers. We were no high-ranking officers. Oh, know? I see. That's what I mean, you see. So uh, they would have certainly mentioned something like that. You know? Were there any other significant battles that occurred while you were in Poland at this time? Uh, any engagements? Yes, uh, the, of course. Uh, there was um, in the uh, early early uh, days of uh, 1944, was the uh, what we call the kettle of uh, Tarnopol. The kettle of uh, yeah the uh, of Tarnopol, the city of Tarnopol was completely encircled. That the SS did not consist uh, solely of Germans. Oh no! Oh, certainly not. I must. I might. I, mean, I don't know what the what the percentage of it was, but uh, quite a. 
high percentage of the members of Russian SS came from all over Europe. Why would non-Germans want to join a German organization that wanted to make Germany the uh, uh, leading force in the world? Were well, I don't think uh, that, that they, they, they were thinking in that on, their, on those lines. They had this, the same attitude towards uh, the uh, menace from the east and uh, to the, of the general threat to the to the Western world from communism, the from communism to the uh, and Bolshevism, as we used to call it at the time. So there were Norwegians, Danes, and uh, quite a large percentage, especially from that little country by the name of Netherlands, Holland, and here from from Britain. So this was a pan-European force then. What you can say that you can say that with every with, yeah with every right you can say that it uh, was uh, all. All European army, and we, that is another thing which gave was a, a motive for us. We felt that we were uh, a real European army that actually deserves the name of the uh, European army. It is nothing, it, uh, what we have today, uh, NATO and whatever, is nothing in comparison to what we were. So I really feel that the Waffen said we were the, the first uh, j uh, European army that deserved this term. So these uh, Frenchmen who were part of the SS Division Charlemagne were volunteers. They were not uh, forcefully no, conscripted. But up to that time, there was the, the whole uh, European army of which, uh, by the name of Waffen SS were all volunteers. And what time was this that we're referring to? Well, in the 43, 44, when I was there and earlier. So the Charlemagne division broke you out of the encirclement, and how did they manage? How did they do that? Well, uh, they uh, just uh, figured out where, where the weak, uh, weakest spot was, and uh, just broke it in with their tanks and whatever, yeah, well, you know, all in, and uh, stayed in to Poland, and the, as I said, in the area of Lublin for a while. And again there, we were sent for uh, 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 guerrilla uh, anti guerrilla warfare. In other words, uh, to clear out uh, these uh, partisan hideout, hangouts, you know, and that is uh, a, a very dangerous un enterprise, you know. I'd rather, from, my, from the experience I made there, I would rather be right in the, in the first front line than do a job like that in the, in the back, you know, we're fighting the, these people because they were hidden from the, the jungles and the houses and they were shot you on the back, uh, next thing you know, and all that. And they uh, used to attack us in open streets, you know, from, from basements and so on. It was a very treacherous kind of, uh, of a war, you know. Now, in our time, according to the uh, prevailing information in the West, partisan has become a good word, the idea of partisan. Uh, there was a, a recent movie called Red Dawn where uh, the partisans were saluted and the partisan spirit was saluted. But you uh, seem to feel that the partisans were almost synonymous with terrorists. Is that true? Yes, I I have uh, great respect uh, for. There were civilian, some civilian outfits. Uh, they were at least recognizable as such. Uh, they had, they didn't have, perhaps didn't have uniforms, but uh, by some means, a helmet or a belt or whatever it was. They were recognizable as soldiers, and it was a fight man to man, and uh, that was understandable and acceptable. But what I do not accept is this treacherous killing of uh, of soldiers from the back, from uh, from a tree or wherever they were hidden. So I give you one another example. They would, for instance, I, I mentioned to you before that I was uh, working as a telephone as a telephone operator. So uh, at times we had to uh, pull the, uh, these uh, wires across long distances through the woods to uh, make the communication. And uh, at some hidden away place in the middle of the forest, they would, the partisan would cut the line, would cut the wire. So naturally two of us or four of us uh, uh, had to go and find a trouble spot. And they were just waiting for that when they came to the to that spot where the wires had been cut, they jumped out of the bush and killed them, murdered them, slaughtered them. 
So that is a kind of war which I do not consider a fair war anymore. That is straight murder as far as I'm concerned. Because the men who had been killed were simply involved in trying to locate this communications equipment? That's right. And uh, I may also add a few words in this respect to uh, what is uh, often referred to and, and is um, and often spoken about today, the Einsatzgruppen. It was a special elite force uh, which had to be which absolutely necessary to deal with this kind, of, this kind of terrorism. Am I correct in understanding you to say that it was an allied force? Oh yes, no, no, no uh, elite, elite, oh. Oh. elite, elite, elite force, you know, select force, and they had a special task. They were special. It was a special combat force to uh, to deal with uh, with these partisan activities. We've been told in the West that uh, this elite group had as its main function the uh, e annihilation of uh, Jews on the Eastern Front. Is, is that so? No, that is absolutely incorrect. Um, it was, as I said, it was, uh, a, a, it may have been so that uh, on, the, on the leading side, on the, uh, the leading officers or commissars, as you call them, they happened to be predominantly Jews for one reason or other. So uh, if they were killed, they were killed as such, as, as partisan guerrillas and not as Jews. It was definitely not intended or not, it wasn't even planned to, uh, uh, to use his force in, in, the, in the combat uh, or in, uh, in the elimination or the extermination or whatever you may say of Jews. Not at all. So but there were uh, quite a number of Jews that they were uh, engaged in this uh, terrorist warfare. But in other words, then, the SS was not going after Jews, they were going after partisans, but right. they weren't sparing partisans who happened to be Jews. If, they, if there were Jews who were bearing arms against the German government, then they would uh, be executed the same as uh, any other Russian partisan. That's for sure. That's for sure. And the same would happen to any other soldier. If, if I do the same thing in the, uh, uh, could have done the same thing in France later on, or if I would go on the other side of the Russian and I would do something, I wouldn't be alive today either, you know, if they got me. That is, uh, it's quite normal and uh, I think it's also uh, quite uh, legal according to the, uh, to the Hague uh, uh, Convention. Uh, when you make this analogy between yourself and, and treatment by the Allied forces, you're saying that had you been captured by the Soviets, or if you were acting as a, as a guerrilla or an irregular, the fact that you are a Christian wouldn't have deterred them from uh, shooting you or executing you because uh, you Soviet Union. How do you account for that? I don't believe in this anti-Semitism on the part of the Soviet Union. I think it's uh, propaganda. I don't really believe in it. Things may have changed a little bit since the last war, that's for sure. Well, how can you say that when they're arming the Syrians and they're providing the main arms to the Arabs? Well, I'm not, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you. It is possible that, that they make a difference between, uh, between Jews and Zionists, you know, as far as I understand. By Yuri Andropov, who has been rumored to have been of Jewish origin and descent, was able to reach a high level of, of power, the highest level, in fact, in the Soviet Union, but at the same time be at the helm of a policy which was anti-Zionist. That's right. That's right. That's what I think. Yeah. But at any rate, you do insist uh, on the fact that uh, many commissars and important leaders in the Soviet Union hierarchy and bureaucracy were, in fact, uh, uh, Jewish. That's right. And uh, we also understood and we learned from uh, Russian prisoners of war, that uh, they had no other, to these poor, so we were also sent right into the front line for a while, well, for two weeks I was right in the first, what they call the main combat line. Where? In, uh, in the Ukraine. And uh, so uh, we could see, practically see the, the, the white in the eye of the enemy, but their own officers. I understand that when they would retreat after strong German resistance to them, that often there were NKVD, uh, the, yes, the right. secret police in the Soviet Union maintains an army. It's not just plain clothes like the police no, here. No, they maintain an army, and if uh, these uh, Russian soldiers were not allowed to, uh, to be taken prisoners. 
They were not allowed. They were had either had to die for the Soviet Union, but uh, they could. They were not allowed to retreat to or to run or to to uh, allow themselves to be taken prisoners. And well, when they were forced, on account of strong resistance, oh, they were shot by their own officers. So you mean to say that if they were taken prisoner uh, through no fault of their own, if they fought very hard against the German forces and were still taken prisoner, uh, that they were regarded as traitors to the Soviet Union? They were more or less regarded as traitors, sure, that's for sure. Uh, it's only, uh, only because uh, the enormous number of, of prisoners we, uh, we had in the first month after the uh, beginning of the Russian campaign nearly four million of them prisoners, you see. So naturally, uh, I don't think that all of them were punished for that later on. But in principle, they were not allowed to. They were not allowed to be taken prisoner by the enemy. You say that not all the four million uh, POWs, Soviet POWs, who fell into the hands of Germans and who were subsequently shipped back to the Soviet Union were murdered. But do you have any first-hand information in general about the fate of these uh, Soviet POWs when they were returned to communist Russia? Not of, not, not of those uh, uh, Russian prisoners, but uh, there were others uh, who, uh, who had been fighting on our side, uh, volunteered for the same reason, like Ukrainians, for instance. And uh, when they were in... Uh, in British and American captivity, and they felt that they were on the safe side now, because they were uh, separated in different compounds, and uh, the, na the neighboring compound was full of uh, these unfortunate Ro Ukrainian soldiers, Poles and whatever they were. And one day the, the whole camp was surrounded by American tanks and, and all that, and they were all dragged away. They were screaming and shouting and begging, but it didn't help. It wasn't any good for them. They were shipped up and they were handed over to the Russians. The Allies, the, the Allies handed them over. Yeah. So I believe that a uh, similar fate, uh, uh, some of the most of, a lot of these on their own, their own so they must have suffered a similar fate. Maybe uh, certainly not all, but... ...accused of killing not only six million Jews, but being responsible for 20 million Soviet dead as a result of attacking the Soviet Union. On the other hand, you seem to be implying that uh, a significant percentage of those casualties were actually caused by Soviet policies themselves, a policy of no retreat, a policy of execution by their own officers. Oh, sure. Sure. That's, that's, that's quite obvious. It's quite obvious. So had there been a different military policy on the part of Stalin, the casualty rate of the Soviet troops would have been significantly lower. Do you believe that? That is for sure. That is sure. And uh, that's quite obvious. Oh, yes, of course. Well, picking up the thread now, um, as, you, as, you moved, as you moved in retreat from the east to the west, how did you find yourself uh, fighting at Anheim in France? How did, how did well, you come uh, to was, uh, I was uh, wounded in uh, in that area, and I was sent uh, uh, back to I was sent back to my garrison. You were in wounded the, in the Ukraine or in Poland? In the in the, in the Poland. Uh, How were you wounded? Uh, I had a uh, I had a, a, a shell shock. I was shell shocked. I'm not. I, I can't say wounded, but from the shell shock, I was deaf, completely deaf on both ears. Mm. See, so I was considered wounded. And I was, they took me back to uh, to the hospital in the, to the uh, garrison where I came from in in uh, in Prussian Germany. Stayed there for a while, and I had my my, my annual leave. What did you do on on your leave on this little holiday that you had? Was that very precious to you, or? Oh yes, I was. I always went to went back to my Dortmund to see my my parents after a long time. Uh, so uh, had, they, the had they been harmed by any Allied bombing, or where was there? Not at the time, but well, later on, they not the idea. When I was already in uh, captivity, my my father, my parents lost two uh, houses in Dortmund in, uh, in February 1945, shortly before the end of the war. They owned two houses that yeah. were destroyed. Were they wealthy they were people? Completely, completely destroyed. Yeah. Were they wealthy people? No, not too wealthy. They, my father had a had a say for in, in America with him. We can be make a, 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 a conditor, you know, that is the, uh, actually a profession. You know. 
Were you able to uh, obtain, when you took this holiday for two weeks, some good candies while you were on this? Uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon? Were you able to have some of your father's oh, confections? Yes. Oh, you? yes. You yeah. some. I brought some of along to my family's store. So anyway, uh, we instead of being moved back to the Eastern Front, probably on account of my... Uh, yeah, my years and all that. We were sent to the, uh, I was sent to the West instead. And uh, they had quickly formed an, an infantry battalion. And uh, it was originally intended to send us to the Western, to the so called West Wall, to the, to the uh, frontiers in, uh, and, in, uh, in the West of Europe to, uh, to work and to, to uh, be uh, stationed in, in one of these uh, shell, bu shelter bunkers there, you know. To repel the D-Day invasion. To repel the D-Day invasion, you see. But, uh, so we, we were moved to that area. I have was the number four company, machine gun company, with uh, 160 strong. And only uh, less than two weeks later, we were uh, 16 of us left. 16 of us left. So S the... 16 out of a company out of, a company of 160, 160 in a week's time? In, a, in a less than two weeks' time. What happened? The, the casualties in, uh, on, the, uh, in, in, uh, on, the Belgian, in, in, on the Belgian front on the Albert Canal were absolutely terrific. How did these, take, how did these occur? Yeah, the, uh, there had been uh, strong reinforcements, from the, especially from the Americans. Fresh uh, unit uh, had come over from the States. And uh, uh, um, if um, um, you want me to, uh, to uh, relate one particular incident that happened in that area, while in, during this period, we were trapped in a, in a small strip of land, there was a strip of land between the river, the river Mass, and the Albert Canal. So we were, we were waiting. And uh, no, they were there. And uh, there was only one option, uh, no other option, but uh, try to get away. And then we, we were in front of the river where I just uh, came over. And I saved myself, and then I saved my life by swimming over the river. That was the only way to get across. But I saw, looking back, while swimming back, and looking back from the other side of the river, that all of them, all my comrades that were left on their strip of land, who were either too tired or they couldn't swim or were wounded, they were all of them shot, murdered by the Americans. All of them. By the American forces? By the American forces. But you did say 16 survived out of the 160 originally, is that Yeah, correct? for my for my outfit. Yeah, but uh, all in all. You know, but, but all I'm the talking, ones that were left I'm on the bank. I'm talking about this, uh, this particular uh, uh, unit, uh, there were not only our, but some others too, you know, there are, to my estimation, five to six hundred people on that strip, or in the, between, they were trapped within, in that, on that strip of land. And they, the Americans uh, would have been known, they could have taken them prison, all of them, but they didn't. I saw you in 17 at the time, he was leaning against a tree, and he was badly wounded from his leg, and he had his arms up, and he was crying, but that isn't, uh, prevent him from being mowed down with the stem gun from, from, uh, from the American soldiers. So none of them were, were of these here, uh, of these 600 was, uh, I think, uh, was uh, left life, you know, that's for sure. I these were 600 men who were massacred before your very eyes? On that strip of land, yeah. By the American troops? By the American troops, yeah. Were you then, what what uh, date was this, what time period was this, 1944? Yeah, that was 1944, just before uh, we moved, uh, we, uh, 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 we at least, uh, a struggle of us, as I said, for my particular, for my own outfit, from that company, there were 16 left, and there were some other struggle from other outfits, so, uh, so we were uh, 50 or 60 again, I thought, then uh, that was, uh, I found myself a uh, member of uh, the SS, you know. But this massacre occurred uh, in, in what uh, month? Yeah, uh -huh. In what month did this massacre occur? was in, uh, oh, it could have been... Would have been May, early June, somewhere like that. May from the from the Dutch border. Can you say how many kilometers, roughly, approximately? Maybe maybe uh, 30, 40 kilometers away from the from the uh, uh, Dutch border.
And at this time, you then went from service with the Wehrmacht to service with the Waffen SS. Yeah, that's right. And then, what was your combat experience with the Waffen SS subsequently to that? It was at Anheim, is that it correct? It was in Anheim. Uh, we were uh, to reinforce uh, a rear part. They had to move away, and we were informed that they were on their way to the east again for some uh, few reason. They, I can say that in retrospect, I, don't, I couldn't tell you exactly how many, how many there were, you know, I have no idea, but not too many anyway. So we were there to reinforce them, and uh, then this landing occurred. The, uh, the Allied, Allied landing. landing. Yeah. American landing? American, Polish, and British. The first wave that came down, if I remember, Poles, you know, and British and Americans. You know. And then what happened? And uh, it was all about that. That uh, a bridge across the river, that, uh, the uh, Arnhem Bridge, which was uh, that was a fight, a fight of many over that, over that, fighting from house to house, you know, and uh, in, in uh, the city of Arnhem. So we had prisoners and wounded in the, in the basements from both sides, you know. and uh, uh, if, I, if I remember the. Uh, the Americans were very, very much afraid. They were scared. They were so scared that they, 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 they thought that well, the end of their lives had come. And they were quite surprised that, that they were treated just like anybody else. They were treated with the wounded they were attended to. And uh, we even shared the last cigarette with them and chocolate, whatever they had. Did you win the Battle of Arnhem? More or less, you can say that was the last uh, major victory of the German army, the Battle of Arnhem. Say that, yeah. And then things uh, did not go well for you because so soon you would be captured. Is that correct? Yes, uh, but I managed uh, still managed to get away from the uh, from the Arnhem area, and I even got uh, across the border into Germany. So uh, we were, of course, we had to we go into position there again with, with whatever we had. Uh, one of that only every every second of us was still above all these Panzerfaust. Which is what? Which is, uh, uh, the Americans, I, I think the Americans would call it the bazooka. Well, these uh, things, uh, they think that uh, it was finished, you know. And where were you sent then? And then, uh, so that, that was in that, was in, in that area, in, in German, already in Germany. And then one morning, of course, you know, we were overrun by the Americans. At where? What location? At uh, a place uh, called well, uh, Heisberg. It's, uh, I would say, about 50 kilometers north of the city of Aachen. And this was in October of 1940? In October 1944. Aachen had already been captured by that time. I think Aachen was captured in August in that year. So Aachen was already in American hands. So the Americans shipped us uh, from uh, from that area uh, right through Belgium to uh, Paris. We spent a few days in a, in a stable there and I call these uh, K Russians or C Russians, these small pack. They just they just flung them in the area there. So for everybody who was quick enough to catch them, they maybe get one or two of these, and, and others didn't get anything. But they said it's not. It's not so bad. Don't worry. You know, the, uh, in four in four hours' time, you will be at our dest at a destination. We'll be fed again, so we were not too worried about it. Uh, but actually, these transfers to the coast took more than four days, and uh, we were already under nourish. Some of them were already under nourish, and there was a bad uh, thing. and uh, some of them uh, were actually uh, actually dead before they even arrived. At the, at the destination. What did they die from? From starvation, under the treatment. That's true. That's true. Because on the way, the Americans couldn't care less. They really couldn't care less whether they fed or not. They were absolutely immaterial. For that. In fact, in one during one of these long stays in the middle of that of that uh, of that uh, way to uh, uh, to the coast, uh, the, the, tra the trains were being shunted around. That's what it took us in all possible directions. You know that's why it took uh, so long. And from the trees, these uh, 
very, these tiny, what, what we call wild apples, they were absolutely unfit for human, human consumption, actually, you know. They had collected them, and they were distributing, distributing these things to the prisoners in the, in the view of wedding rings and watches and whatever one or the other still had in his possession. In other words, they had to trade, the German uh, POWs had to trade their jewelry for these apples? That's right. What oh. were the American troops eating at this time? Oh, everything. They had the big uh, slices of corned beef, and they were eating that right in front. Describe your treatment at a POW camp. You were then sent to a uh, formal POW camp, weren't you, in France? Yeah. Uh, in this camp at Cherbourg, that was the name of the uh, harbor town, it was a huge, I would call it a transit camp. There were, when we were high, we had to stand in there three days and more, you know. No accommodation whatsoever. It was raining and uh, cold, you know. No, no latrines, no shelter of any kind? Absolutely. No nothing. bathroom facilities nothing, or washing nothing, facilities? Nothing. The, uh, and that's it. I, I wonder if I should even mention that. It's so ugly, you know, but if you want me to mention that, I do it. The uh, toilet facility, the la uh, laboratory facility, consisted of dugouts, even level with the ground. If level with the ground, maybe uh, uh, one yard deep, and uh, maybe so with the uh, and there were the, the ground. I said was very, was very slippery and muddy, and they had to sit on the edge of this dugout, you know. So some of them, some of them, they were so weak, and so they probably fell in. They, they fell in just for for sheer weakness. And then they would come with their cameras and photograph us for their Stars and Stripes paper. As the German soldiers uh, fell into their own waste yeah. from weakness, then from the, weakness, the American troops photographed them. They, they really uh, enjoyed it. Yeah, they came with their, their cameras, you know, and uh, probably for their papers, I don't know, maybe for a publication. And yes. uh, how long were you were a POW for the duration of the war then? You were never able to escape? Yeah, so uh, uh, fortunately, it didn't take me very, uh, it wasn't too long, but all in all, maybe roughly four weeks, I was in Sherbourg camp. And from there, we were shipped to... Uh, on, yes, so later on, they had put up some shacks there, you I know. See. But not when we were They went and said, we uh, had to lay, to lay on the ground, and uh, we were packed, packed in there like sardines, so closely that, so when one or the other had to turn around it, like as a normal do in your sleep, the whole lot had to turn around. We had, there was not enough room to move in that. Was yeah. there disease? Was there uh, hunger at this there time? There was uh, uh, dysentery and things like that broke out. And, they, and that is why accounts for the fact that uh, some of my cameras there really looked like, like walking skeletons, including myself. My arms here, if you have seen them at the time, the, the, the two bones beyond them was all clearly visible. I was practically reduced to a skeleton by that time. Then you were shipped to England, and, and, we were, and we were where, where did you, uh, where were you shipped, and how was your treatment there? We were shipped to the south of England. We camped uh, a large, another large transit camp, about 6,000 prisoners in there or more, in the area of Devices in uh, southern England, not to, uh, in the area of Bristol. And that's where I stayed to the end of the war. And uh, that camp was absolutely horrible too. The, the food uh, was just a little bit too much to die, but f not enough to live on. And it was just a bare existence. You know? So we stayed there through the end of the war, and uh, and then they moved us back to Scotland. And from then on, it was all right. And, uh, I can say, in, uh, uh, generally speaking, the treatment in, in those camps depended on the attitude of the uh, commanding officer himself. If he was a German beta, then uh, give us a half time. If he wasn't, then it was all right. If so. Other examples, for instance, uh, when, when they came far away in the north of Scotland, you can't get any further north, it was entirely different. Uh, the commanding officer from of that camp, his name was Lieutenant Colonel Murray, he was from the Black Watch, and he had been taken prisoner himself on, on the island of Crete, of Crete in 1940, I think, or 41, when the island of Crete was conquered by the Germans. And he was the one that handed the island over to the Germans, and he was four years in a German prison camp. He was uh, he, uh, looking for a sh strict uh, military order and discipline, and that was all he, he demanded. But otherwise, he was, I can't say without a word of lie, he was like a father to us. 
He was really very good. So naturally, he had no problems whatsoever. He, there was these uh, detention barracks, you know, for any body that, but that was never occupied. Hardly anybody, whatever, had to be to uh, be punished. Did the Scottish commandant who had been imprisoned by the Germans on Crete relate to you uh, what sort of treatment he received? Presumably. Oh yes, he was uh, overstoken in very high. Uh, he, he, he probably held the Germans in, in, high, in very high esteem, according uh, on the basis of his own ex experience. Oh yeah, a little half year. Was this due to the fact that you were a member of the Waffen SS? Not at all. No, 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 nothing to do with that. No, no. Why were you imprisoned an extra three years? Well. And that was, uh, I don't know, when uh, a large number of new arrivals came from the United States and Canada, and especially from the United States, they all of a sudden came to Leonard in our camp. And they told us in the, that in the United States they had been officially repatriated. They were told, they were being told, now you are on the way to back home and all that, the present Scotland, and stayed there for another two and a half years. <laughs> Yeah. And yet there was never a reason given, never a trial? No, no, nothing. not at all, not at all. Not at and then on a whim you were released in 1948. When? On a, on a whim. I mean, in other words, just at their own initiative they decided to release you. Yeah, that's right. That's right, yeah. The Waffen-SS has been labeled by the Allied governments as a criminal organization, the implication being that every member of the Waffen-SS is a war criminal. Mm, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Why? Well, it is, uh, it's just an uh, pro it's just allied propaganda. It's just war propaganda, that's all. And uh, it's understandable. I mean, what say that it wasn't so? It has been said that uh, the Waffen SS, along with uh, the Hitler government, exterminated six million Jews in uh, the various camps. Do you believe that? No, not at all. Not at all. Why not? It just imagine uh, you only it only takes a little bit of logic uh, to then you to know that it was absolutely impossible. The and um, when we were when I was in British captivity, once in a while, we used to be interrogated by people that came, especially from London, and the, uh, the idea was to uh, re-educate us and to make a uh, good Democrat out of us, you know. So they interrogated us and uh, asked us all sorts of questions and so on. And they, of course, they ac accused us of having known all that. It's impossible to have not the slightest idea about these things. They showed us films of concentration camps, uh, which were to us absolutely unbelievable. Uh, so I said, "What do you want? What do you ask? What do you want to see about that?" I said, "I can't. I can't see anything about it because I have never heard of it." Mm -hmm. But uh, so, but uh, these, these interrogators that seem to be of the opinion that the whole German nation must have known it, and. And they were right from their point of view, because if such a thing had actually happened, it would be impossible to conceal it from the whole of the German nation. It would have been absolutely impossible uh, uh, related today. So the films that they were showing you, uh, which they claimed to be films of people who had died as a result of poison gas chamber extermination, uh, how do you explain the piles of bodies? Was this due to disease yeah. or uh, these pictures, these atrocity photographs of dead people? How, how do you account for the, the scenes of uh, death and destruction that met the Allies when they, when they went to Dachau and Belsen and so forth? Yeah, at, the time, at the time, I couldn't account for these photos, but there were some of my comrades who recognized this special of Buchenwald and other camps. And uh, there was, uh, I remember seeing a big pile of bodies that were burned in open, in open on the street. And uh, there were, uh, at where they claimed he was taken, it was in the city of Dresden. And uh, as we all know today, uh, Dresden was bombed in uh, February 1945. And uh, in about three hours, a uh, quarter of a million people were, were killed. In that, in that area. <coughs> Civilians or soldiers? 
uh, civilians, uh, civilians. So uh, the uh, local authorities uh, had, uh, they were un absolutely unable to cope in the middle of the street. The local German authorities, local, right? Okay. It was a structure, a structure of railroad, uh, rails, and then the bodies were piled and they were burned. And these, uh, these, uh, these were shown in that film. So uh, somebody said aloud, that is Dresden. And then uh, uh, he was taken out by the military police. I don't know what they did to him. They were taken out of the audience, you know. Patients again, eh, when we were interrogated. Uh, then uh, it could have meant a uh, very uh, harsh treatment, you see. So, so uh, naturally, I couldn't confirm it. I didn't see it. All I said, I don't know about it. And if that, uh, and, and I used to say, invariably, used to say to the interrogator, if these things really did happen, I would be the last person in the world to approve of it. If you can prove it, that is all right. Then all I could do at the time. But some of these pictures then, which were, the attribution was potty, bodies, piles of, of bodies of uh, uh, Jews and free thinkers and Jehovah's Witnesses and others who had died in the uh, concentration camps, some of them, were actually bodies of Germans who had been killed by Allied bombers at Dresden. That is very possible. I, I'm quite sure that, yes, uh, that is so, yeah. Now, you're a citizen... But, uh, as I said, I, uh, I was at that time, I, I, was in, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't involved myself. I was not in Dachau myself, so I can't uh, relate these things from my own personal experience. You're a citizen of West Germany today, is that correct? That's right. Uh, what could happen to you for speaking out in the way that you have here today uh, if you made this videotape in West Germany and it was broadcast. Would uh, anything happen to you or would, the, would you be all right? No, I think it would not, would not uh, be all right. I could uh, relate my experience on the Russian front, that's for sure, because millions of uh, come ex uh, experience similar things and also Others have uh, stories to say about uh, treatment in, uh, in American and, and uh, French prison of war camps, you see. So uh, nobody could say anything about it, uh, holding that uh, these are well-established facts, and everybody who casts doubts on it, he can either be either a fool or, or a Nazi or, or whatever. And uh, so that you can really get into trouble there. Can you briefly relate to me uh uh, because of a certain factor that we're dealing with. Uh, can you briefly relate to me what occurred recently to uh, one of your SS comrades? Uh, earlier you had told me that he in some way attempted to uh, defy the ban on discussion of uh, the so-called Holocaust, and uh, he has been tried and convicted. Is that correct? Yeah, that is right. And they were mostly fighting in the east, in the, in the front line, in the eastern front. He had been an officer, he's about uh, he's three years older than he's about 63 now, and uh, he was brave enough to publish a small brochure uh, with, with, uh, with bearing the title, there were no, and uh, so we felt it was what we in, would interest a number of people, it was translated, and, uh, and he published it, and he was taken to court, and it, and it took about uh, quite a few years with all these different instances, so from, from the local court and the higher court and the highest court. And uh, about six weeks ago, the final judgment was passed, and that is, was 18 months prison without probation. That's it. So uh, he is uh, waiting, he's sitting at his home, uh, and he may be uh, taken to prison any day now. Actually, uh, because it, it was an inter intervention of a high, of a powerful uh, uh, agency in Berlin to uh, revoke uh, this probation. If the, or the former sent, if you stay out of trouble, then you are free. And by this center, this probation, this part of probation, that was revoked on, on uh, special instruction by, by those people in Berlin. Mr. Van der Heide, if you had to do it all over again, uh, would you? What do you mean by all over? If you had to, uh, if knowing what you know now, and you were in Germany and you were called up for the armed forces, would you have served? And are you proud of your service uh, on behalf of uh, of the uh, 
uh, Hitler regime at that time? Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Thank you for joining me today. Okay.